week we have Oliver Richmond. Uh, he is a research professor in the Humanitarian and Conflict Research Institute and the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Manchester. He's here this week to teach our peace and conflict uh, theory course. So thank you very much for taking our questions. Um, in your work, you go through the genealogy of peacemaking, comprising uh, a first generation, second generation, third generation, and hybrid piece. And you indicate uh, a first generation of peacemaking, which is a realist approach dominated by elites through top level diplomacy and military methods. And the second generation approach of peacemaking is more about citizen diplomacy and addressing root causes of conflict from below. Um, part of your assessment of the bottom up approach is that it allows people to communicate with the enemy um, and exchange ideas and uh, empowering all people, even the marginalized, to have a role in resolving conflict. Um, yet uh, methods like workshops, for instance, don't translate into political policies. So uh, what, is, what is preventing knowledge from peace building approaches at the individual and group levels from trickling up to the state, regional, and international levels? And how can we improve on this? Well, at the international level, um, many uh, international programs, policies, as well as the personnel, um, tend not to be able to understand the signals that are coming from the grassroots level. They don't really understand the issues or the language or the physical culture or history of these specific places. And in fact, they are um, used to using standardized universal kind of blueprints to underpin policy formulation in those contexts. So they're not really um, able or aware of the political struggles that have been going on at the grassroots level, perhaps against other groups or against their state um, or at the regional level. Or if they are aware, they have, let's say, limited knowledge. The second thing is that they're embedded in a, um, a framework um, themselves, which is very different. They come from a very different context, a very different development setting, um, and so on. Sometimes that's not the case, things have changed a bit now and the UN system is more diverse in terms of its personnel and so on. Um, but uh, these policies have become standard blueprints and they, they, go, they go on and on, they sort of echo through um, the, the modern period um, without much revision. An example of that is the inability of the UN to translate its project calls for funding into local languages. It's been a problem that we've known about for 20 years or more. Um, but in the various um, UN funding programs for local grassroots organizations and so on, um, it's actually quite rare that they can um, submit their calls for action or funding support in their own language. I think that's indicative of a kind of power relation. Not direct, but um, subtle. At the state level, well, it's, um, it's also problematic at, at the state level because state elites are often part of the problem. Um, and they are intent on preserving what they can of their historic power. Um, and they often do so by uh, you know, forming very close relationships with certain international actors, which allow them to you know, slightly co-opt them, while at the same time being um, involved in um, maintaining local um, power formulations too. So that's a talk between the international um, and, and the local, and they do what they do best, which is play both sides off against each other. At the local level, things get more difficult, because here in the, the zone of everyday life, as it were, people don't really have time to um, engage so much in you know, long-term physical planning or institution building, um, to talk to internationals, um, and they don't really have the power to talk to internationals or influence the, the state level. So these are all different types of blockages in the kind of communicational process where the local and the international, the states and so on, could start to build a more consensual framework in which they could share power, renegotiate each other, um, and you know, redesign each other's strategies for building a more sustainable peace. At every level that you look at, there's a whole range of um, blockages. And although it's very frustrating often for um, reformist mind minded individuals in the international system at the state level and um, at the local level. Um, what they often end up doing is falling back on um, 
policy formulation that come from international organizations, the UN system, the World Bank, um, which themselves are sort of generalized strategies which have been designed out of a broad range of experience. And the more generalized they become, the less contextualized they are, the more distant they become, and perhaps the less, effect less effective um, they are too. You and other peace scholars point out that the prominent peace building approaches come from a Eurocentric or Western mindset, which is problematic, you say, because they assume individualism, even though two-thirds of the world belongs to a non-individual society. How much discursive space in the peace building field is there for the global South or the non-Western um, societies? How, how much does the global South contribute to peace and conflict theory? Well, I mean, okay, the figures are probably a bit more um, debatable than those that you give us, but um, I would say that much of the theory that underpins the you know, Anglophone um, epistemology about peace, um, but also policy practice um, has really been developed in uh, a small range of northern universities and policy settings. And so that means that they are infused with issues, concerns, norms, and agendas that are local to those policy settings and, and universities. Um, and it's only been, I think, um, relatively recently that the very many voices from the South throughout history have begun to be heard in, in that um, context. So in the context of you know, post-colonial and anti-colonial discussions about intervention, state formation, state building, and so on, there's lots of things we can learn, um, but they're kind of selectively crowded out of the, of the discussion. I think there's more, um, there, there is an interest now in getting away from Eurocentrism in, in policy and, and, and theory. Um, and it's inevitable, many of our, our students and many of our policymakers coming up through the system now um, have very different backgrounds. And the, the institutions themselves that are used for peace building and development have changed substantially in their, in their character. There's still a general, let's say, liberal peace consensus. Maybe it's shifted more towards a neoliberal um, um, consensus. And some of the, the broader influences, the more diverse influences that might come out of corners of the international system that have long been quite hidden to the Eurocentric gaze of policy and theory um, have yet to make a major impact. But I don't doubt that they will, because this is um, an issue of justice and democracy and sustainability, and one can't make peace in a positive term, positive terms, and particularly not in positive hybrid terms, um, without more or less everybody being included in a, in a constructive um, conversation. And, you know, as, as we've just said, there's lots of institutional barriers, both in, in uh, local political institutions, in state-level institutions, and in international institutions that have kept those voices out of the system. Um, but I think they are slowly being overcome. Uh, your research shows that the peace, div peace dividend is not being shared equally, and that uh, even 20 years after liberal peace settlements are made, income inequality worsens, although all other areas show improvement. Uh, why is this so, and what specific improvements must be made well, I think liberal peace building and all forms of intervention since um, the early 1990s, in most contexts anyway, um, have introduced a pattern that we know well in the West, um, which is a very intimate relationship between legal rights, human rights, um, con democratic constitutionalism, um, so representation within democracy, um, which are very heavily regulated and enforceable by state institutions such as the judiciary and the police. Um, but when it comes to distributing the resources of the state, the picture is a bit messier. If we know, I mean, if we accept, accept at least that uh, one of the constant themes of literature about peace and conflict, war, um, development, and so on, over the last many decades has been that inequality is a problem. Inequality is something which tends to feed conflict, whether it's identity, resource, um, inequality of access to power, um, access to public services and institutions. Inequalities in these 
um, at these different levels um, is often something which could be a spark for conflict. So when it comes to the marketized version of the liberal peace that we've had in the last 25 years or so, um, the state has a very small role in distributing resources. So it has a very big role in security, a big role in law um, and human rights and in its, through its institutions in promoting representation. Um, but um, in line with the neoliberal, um, if you like, position of many of the international financial institutions that we have, and many of the donors, Europe and the US and so on, um, people, well, the state has been planned in such a way as um, not to become so engaged in resource distribution. Resource management, but not redistribution. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is if inequality, material, as well as identity, as well as access to services, those types of inequalities are triggers for conflict, then what's the point of a state that doesn't deal with inequality? Well, the point is, as it has been um, argued, that such a state invites foreign di direct investment. So after a peace settlement in a post-conflict state, all of a sudden the stabilization that occurs offers cheap labor and natural resources and those sorts of things. So foreign companies will come in, bring in capital, and that capital will trickle down and provide you know, that money and resources for, for, for everyone. But if the state isn't designed to do some basic redistribution, then those resources end up in the pockets of just a few. And those just a just few, if you like, tend to be the existing elites who are already well positioned to, to negotiate and form relationships with international actors, international financial institutions, international companies, and all the rest of it. So the, the fact that the state has a very small role in regulating economic inequality due to current um, and a dominant model of thinking about politics in the state and the global world means that it can't undertake one of its fundamental um, requirements in a post-conflict environment, um, which is to try and find out, even out inequalities in terms of open access to institutions, resources and services, and um, basic access to resources necessary for everyday life, whether financial um, or related to things like education and healthcare and basically institutional um, access. If a state doesn't do that, and it just provides security and abstract legal rights, then we may have a problem here. So the data seems to suggest, I think, um, that that's more or less what's been happening. You know, living standards have been improved. What we expect after a conflict, they're very low. So it wouldn't take much to improve them. The data shows that they have improved a little bit, at least. Um, but what we also see is quite a big problem with the widening of the gap between rich and poor. In other words, liberal peace building, or neoliberal peace building, if you might want to call it, has um, been of more benefit to the elites who are more positioned to play this system um, than to the masses who probably suffered most in the conflict. So that means the peace dividend and that one hoped would come out of liberal peace building type approaches has been um, fleeting, and we could do better. Okay. And uh, lastly, uh, to what extent is there a blueprint for building uh, peace uh, or a universal normative system? To what extent is it true that humans all around the world are the same organism with the same basic needs? Well, I don't, I don't know whether I can comment on the last part of the question, mm -hmm. but I think there has been a blueprint, mm -hmm. and it's been um, something which many policymakers and scholars would like to deny. I mean, many people reject the fact that most development, peace building, peacekeeping, peace enforcement, or intervention type um, processes operate um, along a common normative framework. But I mean, if you look at every single um, document that we have as a representation of policy, the whole range of interventions, invasions, peace building operations and so on, we have, and they're all more or less aimed at human rights developments, neoliberal you know, forms of developments, um, supporting a bit of civil society, democratization um, type um, process. So that is a kind of general blueprint. And, and you know, behind that is a belief that there are basic, universally shared 
um, commonalities across humanity and human rights represents these um, basic, um, if you like, um, universal systems that we all um, work within. Um, my, my kind of feeling about that is the problem is um, that they are, I mean, as, as a universal system, it would be fine if everybody signed up to them. But what we see is within this so called universal system, millions of people don't have a voice because they don't speak that language or engage with those concepts. Um, it rejects different modes of political organization and social organization. So this is a secular constitutional legal framework for, for the world, um, effectively, um, which you know I, I would love to see um, have more traction than it currently does. But on the other hand, can we really be sure that it, it uh, represents uh, people in every development setting, or every conflict affected society, who haven't had any opportunity to speak about it um, either? And if we can't be sure about that, what would be added or changed about this universal system? So it's not the universality that I necessarily object to, it's more the fact that we claim universality without actually having tested and asked and included um, the full range of the world's population. You might say that's an impossible thing to do, but um, on the other hand, I think we could have, we could make a better and clearer um, attempt to understand different forms of social, political, and cultural um, organization. One of the lessons of the last 25 years of liberal peace building is that there are different forms of organization out there and people value them, they have legitimacy, um, and that they want to include them in their new post-conflict modern state. So that suggests to us that the, the liberal peace's version of universal norms aren't quite as universal as we expect, or at least not broad enough, um, and that we might need to be thinking about more sophisticated and later generations of human rights in, in that context. And then maybe beyond that, thinking about distributive forms of justice, um, where resources really are transferred across the planet in order to deal with the, the very pressing questions of development and conflict and, and so forth that we see uh, emerging around the world. So it's not so much the existence of universal norms that I, I um, am necessarily questioning, but more the fact that these haven't really been negotiated mm -hmm. fully and materially um, with all the different um, issues and communities that we see across history and across space, geographic space in, in, in the world today. So it's easy to claim that it's universal, um, but less easy to um, demonstrate that these have local legitimacy in every context. And we would have to do that if they were to be fully accepted as, as universal. Mm -hmm. So we could have a, a blueprint for, for building peace that includes, as long as it includes everyone's uh, everyone's input, including the, the global south, not just the north, the, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the western, the Europeans. Well, as long as it includes difference. Mm -hmm. So in other words, this, this blueprint is not about homogenization. Mm -hmm. um, it's about pluralism. It's inclusive forms of pluralism, not exclusive forms of pluralism. Um, and I think you know, behind that we have to accept that there are material factors. It's all very well claiming universal human rights, but what does that mean if, if I can exercise my human rights more than somebody in a conflict-affected society? Materially speaking, my human rights are much more significant in terms of my ability to practice them, than somebody who's afflicted by conflict and, and a development issue, probably can't exercise their human rights, probably doesn't know um, the legal framework system, or doesn't have access to, or have time to have access to those institutions that would guarantee those rights. So behind that, there's a material aspect. And I, I, will, I often wonder, certainly concerns me, that these notions of, of these universal notions are, are used to avoid having to engage with those deeper structural problems. That's uh, also feed the conflict. Thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Thank you. Right. Okay.